Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this On Aging Conversation. I'm Barbara McMillan, Provincial Community Engagement Coordinator for United Way British Columbia's Healthy Aging Team. I'd like to start by acknowledging and expressing appreciation for the opportunity to live, work, gather on the traditional ancestral territories of all First Nations in this land we now call Canada. On Aging Conversations is a collaboration between Health Aging Corps and Help Age Canada. If you missed earlier episodes, you can find them on Apple or Anchor Podcasts on YouTube and on Healthy Aging Corps Canada, the national knowledge hub connecting agencies that support and advance independent living for older Canadians. And the lineup of On Aging speakers on Core and links to the recordings, along with a lot of other interesting and useful information, can be delivered to your inbox if you are signed up for the twice monthly Core e news. And you can do that at www.health theagingcore.ca. In our work with CORE, HelpAge, and the extraordinary network of community-based senior serving agencies, volunteers, and professionals across Canada, we are privileged to encounter many thought leaders and innovators in the field of healthy aging, such as today's guest, Dr. Kieran Ribeiro. And so, On Aging Conversations was launched to help bring some of these ideas, innovations, and perspectives to a wider audience. And that's it, a 30-minute conversation with a featured guest providing healthy aging information, ideas, and inspiration every two weeks. And I'll now turn it over to Gregor Snedden, CEO of Help Age Canada, your host for On Aging. Thanks, Barb. Welcome, everybody. Help Age Canada supports community-based initiatives through partnerships across Canada and around the world to improve the lives of older persons and their communities. And I'm just thrilled to have with us today my colleague and friend, Dr. Kieran Ribeiro. Dr. Ribeiro is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Ottawa and a geriatric psychiatrist at the Ottawa Hospital. He is designated as a founder of the subspecialty of geriatric psychiatry by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and the lead, along with Margaret Gillis of the International Longevity Centre of the Canadian Coalition Against Ageism. Welcome, Kieran. Thank you very much, Gregor. Nice to be here, and thank you for inviting me to be on, on this podcast. Really appreciate it. As we normally do, we could probably spend the whole day chatting about these matters, but why I'm actually really curious if you would tell us a little bit about you, and just so that the folks know who are listening, his actual bio is about a page and a half to two pages long in size five font. So I've just snapshotted a couple of highlights there. But Kieran has developed a passion around the issue of aging and translated that passion, channeled that passion into your life work, which is amazing. Tell us a little bit about that. How did you develop such a passion and desire and, and ability to manifest that into your work? Gregor, thank you for giving me the opportunity to trace this right back to my formative years, to my roots. This all began with the person who spent the most time with me, that raised me largely and gave me the values and the culture and the sensitivity that I currently have for older people. And that was my paternal grandmother. This woman was incredible in terms of her wisdom, her knowledge and her attitudes and many skills, but she was completely illiterate. The reason I say that is because despite being educationally formally illiterate, she taught me everything I know today. I see a bit of her in every older person that I've ever treated. And now I'm hoping that we can change the way people treat older people in Canada and across the world, because I think that is a really big unmet need, which is ageism. And that's part of what we're here to talk about today. So Karen, your, your experience comes right from the heart and you have taken that with you. And really that has driven you your whole career to what mm -hmm. you're doing exactly. today. Right. So I spent the, the better part of 40 years taking care of older people in my family practice first, and then as in my subspecialty area, which is geriatric psychiatry, and individual people and their families. But for the past eight to 10 years, I've kind of ventured into the whole human rights arena and thinking about why older people are not getting the kind of treatment that other people get in this world. And it basically boils down to their human rights, the way people think about them, the way they feel about them, and the way they act towards older people, which is what we call ageism. And we now actually have a, a global report on that published by the World Health Organization in 2021, which I think is here, which is what the main topic is today. So, you know, I really want to talk about the Canadian Coalition Against Ageism, and there's lots for us to explore there. But mm -hmm. 
you know, what's really on top of my mind is the amazing week that we we just had together with, with other colleagues down in New York at the United Nations General Assembly. We were there as part of the open-ended working group on aging, where we are advocating for the Convention on the Rights of Older People. I mean, what a week. It was unbelievable. It was a great week. And, you know, we had some amazing discussions. But what made it very special for us this year is that we've had the Minister of Seniors who who came with us, uh, the Canadian Federal Minister of Seniors, accompanied by, I think, at least eight to 10 of our Canadian NGOs, which is an amazing show of solidarity and support for human rights for older people. Along with the uh, strong voice of Bob Ray, the permanent ambassador to the UN. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really a wonderful experience to be there. This convention, through the week, there's a lot of kind of a political drama going on because we know that all of these countries, there's a lot of talking happening behind the scenes. Everyone's giving their presentation on the floor and, and, you know, we're all listening and observing and trying to move things along. But at the end of the week, we had consensus on moving a motion forward. Can you just tell us a little bit about why that was so important and what that sets us up for for mm-hmm. next year, for 2024? Right, right. So, Gregor, just, just to give your listeners a better sense of the whole picture, if I may just take a minute Please, and, yeah. and outline, like I'm a very visual person. I like to think in pictures and I like to keep things as simple as possible. So let me ask you to think about a pyramid. And at the tip of the pyramid is where the United Nations does its work, which is, you know, on a global stage. There are basically two stages. One is the global stage, and which is the tip of the pyramid. But you and I and all the other Canadians at, of any age work live and play and enjoy life at the base of the pyramid. And there's a lot of layers between what happens at the UN and what happens at the base. So for the past 13 years, there's been this group called the Open-Ended Working Group on Aging, and they've been meeting every year to try and find solutions to, to human rights violations for older people. Now, if you go back to 1946, when the UN came up with the Declaration of Human Rights, most people didn't even reach the age of 60. So there was no aging was not a phenomenon back then. And there have been several treaties that have since been signed by the UN, but none of them have really enshrined the human rights for older people within them. So for the past 13 years, we've been trying to get the UN to do that, but we've actually failed miserably every year. There's been no appetite on behalf of most of the major member states to support that. But this year, we actually moved the needle in the right direction, although the change is fairly small, but it's a significant change. And what I'm really happy and proud to to tell you or to tell the audience is that Canada is now starting to play a big leadership role in that process. Oh, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. So exciting. Why do you think a convention is important? What is that going to give the world, the Canada? What what is it that we're so impassioned to, to work towards achieving that document? Great question. Thank you for posing it. I, I was hoping you would ask me that question, because this is a question that people often have difficulty getting their heads around is what is a convention? What would it do? And why don't we have it already? So in terms of background, we I think we have talked about the Global Report on Ageism, which was published in 2021 basically saying that one out of two people in this world are ageist against older people. And the COVID-19 pandemic, with, with its extensive societal ageism, has created a dual pandemic of COVID-19 and, uh, and ageism itself. And it's laid bare the decades of human rights violations against older people, both in Canada and across the world. Now, Canada is a very well placed to play this leadership role in advancing and promoting human rights of older people. And this is a legacy piece that may be in our current government's favor if they actually work towards it. So the first thing a UN convention would do is actually help combat ageism at the global stage and at a national stage. And I think, you know, we have to think about this as a framework, which is ethical, moral, and legal. It would provide a lens to be used by all member states to to scrutinize every policy, every procedure, theory, program, law, 
to ensure culpability. So it would actually have a framework where people would be held accountable for having a human rights lens in anything they do for older people. Secondly, it would guide policy making. It would provide a framework for all policies and older persons, encourage collection of data and information to help governments to allocate resources more fairly. And it would also encourage greater development of policy and programs that benefit older people. Thirdly, it would improve accountability. A UN convention would provide reporting and accounting mechanisms for member states and provide a redress system for violations of those older person's rights. You know, and I, in closing, I want to say that this is not the first time we're talking about a convention. It's been proven effective through many other conventions, such as the UN Convention on Women, on Children, Persons with Disability, which have been shown for the last many years to be very positive in terms of in enriching and enhancing the human rights of all these people. It's been shown to educate and empower people. And most importantly, it will make them rights bearers, just like every other person, to, that they actually have their human rights. And this is enshrined in law. So what's the process from here? So we, we now have uh, the motion that was brought forward. They will now have two uh, chairs focusing on identifying gaps in the provision of rights for older people in the world and again, a commitment to gather again in 2024. But what do you think, what, what are, what are the, mm -hmm. the steps going to be to get us mm -hmm. to the convention from here? What's the play? Okay, so so let me, um, if, you, if you don't mind, um, let me just rephrase the question a little bit, if that's okay. So over the past 13 years, since the open-ended working group has started, Gregor, we've had, we have mountains of evidence about mm -hmm. the gaps. There have been two major reports written on every single gap with tons of evidence that has been presented to the UN. The problem so far has been there's been no political will to move forward with it. There are some member states among, in the United Nations who do not believe in human rights, and they have dominated the stage by vetoing certain procedures. And you can guess what those member states are. I'm not going to name them publicly. I don't like to, to shame or, or blame people uh, in public, but I'm sure you know which states they are that might be. And many of the, the more friendly states are very neutral at this stage, including Canada, which is open. They're open to the idea, but they haven't stepped through the door. In 2018, Canada actually said that the door is open, but now we need them to step through the door and actually support it. Last year, Ambassador Bob Ray had a big part to play in this. He got a core group of member states, which are you know friendly states, to form this little group. And since then, we've had more input into that. Lately, that group has actually gathered momentum. And this was the, the decision that you've referred to earlier in your question, where this decision has been now brought to the open-ended working group and now has been approved by consensus to do some work between the two sessions. So it's the intersessional group. And now they have to nominate two co-chairs to lead this. Their mandate will be to actually present some more information to move forward with the convention at the next open-ended working group, which would be in 2024. So it's very exciting that this is a, a fairly big step forward. Well, that's exciting. Looking forward to uh, to attending again next year and supporting. And uh, thank you for the amazing work that you've taken in such a phenomenal leadership role uh, in Canada and the world uh, to move this along. And maybe we can extend a thank you to your paternal grandmother as well. Thank you. Thank you, Gregor. Um, I, I don't know how we are for time, but some people may want to know what are the arguments against a UN convention, and which which can be summarized very easily. So some people argue that older people's rights are, have already been enshrined in other UN instruments. And the comeback, to the answer to that is, if that were the case, we wouldn't have conventions to protect people with disabilities, women or children. And older people have not had their rights enshrined in the current, adequately in the current mechanisms, because we see their violations happening every day uh, in, in every sector. 
Some people have said that soft law, such as the Madrid International Plan of Action, protects human rights. And the fact is that these gaps are not sufficiently closed by the Madrid International Plan of Action because it doesn't have any teeth. It doesn't have any legally binding elements to it. So the Madrid International Plan and the Convention are both needed because the Convention would actually give more clout and more teeth to make the member states accountable. Some people talk about the cost, and there are basically three answers to that. One is that we should think about what is the cost of not having a convention, because older people's rights are equally important. But we also know that ageism costs the governments a lot of money. So there's a big study done two or three years ago showing that the cost due to ageism just in the healthcare sector is $63 billion, B, billion dollars in the U.S. alone per year, hmm. not to mention the healthcare costs, which are largely reflected in mental health issues, such as social isolation, loneliness, anxiety, and some physical conditions as well. That really moves us into another area here for us to have a word on, and that's the, our new Canadian Coalition Against Ageism that mm -hmm. yourself and, and Margaret Gillis of uh, ILC have spearheaded and brought together leaders from across the country, of, of which Health Age Canada is a proud member. The vision of the uh, coalition is a Canada free of ageism against older persons. I mean, that's a big vision, a Canada free of ageism. That's a bold vision to, to try and state. And what's the path? And how do you see the coalition affecting change uh, in Canada? Up until the WHO report on ageism was published in 2021, people had a difficult time putting their thoughts and ideas into a framework. But that report, and I would encourage all your all your listeners or readers of the podcast to have a look at it. Uh, it's a WHO report, Global Report on Ageism. If I will, if you'll if you'll spare, I'll just read here the definition that the WHO in that report defines ageism as the stereotypes, how we think, prejudice, how we feel, and discrimination, how we act toward others or oneself based on age. Mm -hmm. And to just add to that, if you continue reading that I think it's in the same paragraph that one out of two people yeah. are ageist against older pe persons in this world. Um, yes. And then it goes on to, to say that while other forms of discrimination, such as racism and sexism are widely condemned, ageism disappointedly remains accepted and unchallenged in many situations. Ageist attitudes and beliefs held towards older persons and the actions resulting from them, along with a general lack of social awareness of ageism, have negative health, social, societal, and economic impacts. Right. So ageism is a very stealthy, it's a very insidious process, and it harms the global economy, the global health, while it violates human rights. It creates inequity, injustice, loss of dignity. It creates intergenerational conflict. And it's a barrier to change policies and to promote healthy aging. Ageism also interacts in an intersectional way with other forms of ism, such as mentalism, which is discrimination against people with, with mental health conditions, ableism, people with disabilities, sexism and racism, not to mention a few others, which also intersect with uh, ageism. Older people, we, with all of those particular intersections, their quality of life is much, much lower. It causes premature death, and it's compounded over, it, the disadvantage is compounded over the life course. But this has become much more evident during the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's laid bare the impact of decades of ageism, and it's capitalized unprecedentedly in the catastrophes that we see in older people's lives. I wonder if we can observe it's very, very, very quick to see ages in, on the in the international uh, forum, you know, many countries without any social security of any kind, no disaggregated data, uh, the inability of, of humanitarian actors to address the needs of older people and so on. What would be some examples, maybe even from your own experience as a physician, of where you have seen ageism and affect older people in Canada and what we might do together to bring change to prevent those kinds of things from continuing? You know, Gregor, I can talk a lot about the healthcare sector because that's where I spend most of my time. 
but I've also seen it in all sectors of my life. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners would agree. Older people have, ex and especially during COVID-19, during the pandemic, older people have experienced accelerated and precipitous declines in their physical and mental health, including their cognition sometimes, their function and their behavior, which we see resulting in frailty, insurmountable fear and social isolation, anxiety and depression. I've seen people come in with suicidal feelings because they feel marginalized, neglected, and often abused in, in many different ways. They feel loss of dignity, and requests for medical assistance in dying are not uncommon from older people. We've heard gut-wrenching, inhumane stories of older people and their families, who are sh and these are shamefully abundant, even in our wonderful country of Canada, which is the, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. The one sector that sort of takes the, the prize, if you like, in terms of ageism is the long-term care sector that we've mm -hmm. all dealt with. And you know that Canada had the worst outcome in long-term care deaths over 80% of our deaths were in long-term care during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I just read about that today in one of the prominent journals, that this is still the case. Older people are still not being treated properly, appropriately with, with the COVID-19 you know, backdrop. It's changed the fabric of our society by older people being left behind. They're made invisible and marginalized in every way, in every sense of the word. So we really need to, in an urgently, in an ethical and moral and legal sense, change the way ageism is infecting our society. I want to make sure I open the floor here a little bit to Barbara. Just one, one quick question, Karen. Mm -hmm. What is one thing that a person can do, regardless of their age, what's one thing that someone can do to help counter ageism? Great question, Barbara. Thank you for asking. I, I think that, first of all, people need to be aware of what ageism is, because the biggest barrier, in my view, is people not realizing that they themselves are aging, we probably should have touched on this a few minutes ago when we talked about the definition of ageism, but there are three forms of ageism, right? There's one that is interpersonal, where a person acts in an ageist way towards another person. The other one is institutional ageism, where you're in a hospital or in a bus or in a supermarket where you get treated in a, in a different way because of your age. But the most important one, I think, is the self-ageism, when a person looks at themselves in the mirror and doesn't appreciate that they are getting older and they discriminate against older people because of their own anxiety about aging. I think, Barbara, if I had to pick one of those three aspects, I would say we need to work on the self-ageism because that will raise awareness and change people's way of thinking across the lifespan. We talked about the coalition, Canadian Coalition Against Ageism. This is a very crucial part of the solution because we now have 15 organizations which we all work with with aging, and it's a comprehensive nationwide program to combat ageism. And we're going to continue to work together in a national multi-pronged social change campaign in collaboration with all these different players. And it's a multi-year agenda hopefully will result in some kind of a sustainable, scalable adjustment and transformation of the policies and the practices across the country and change the power dynamics and the mindsets that underlie, that underlie ageism. Let me just finish by saying one thing. What you permit, you promote. I think if we continue to permit ageism, we are actually promoting it. And so let's stop it once and for all, become aware that it actually does exist and start to make the changes in the way we think and the way we feel and the way we behave towards older people simply because of age. Thank you. Thanks again, Dr. Ribeiro. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Look forward to having you on the show again as the Canadian Coalition Against Ageism takes flight. And to all of our listeners, please do join us every second Thursday here on On Aging Canadian Conversations. And I'm your host, Gregor Snedden with Help Age Canada. We'll see you next time.